Hi, this is David Shoemaker, and I'd like to welcome you to Living Thelema. Now, on this episode, we're going to talk about the role of the ego in the great work. Um, this is something that is interwoven with a lot of the previous uh, episodes of Living Thelema, but just bits and pieces. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is weave all of that together um, in a more or less uh, unified way. Um, and to do that, let's start with some definitions. First of all, it's extremely important to understand that when we talk about ego here, um, I'm using that in the Jungian sense of ego. This is not the ego that we use kind of in a pejorative sense when we say someone has a lot of ego or is egotistical. This is, um, this is simply, the ego in this, in this instance is simply the, um, the everyday self, the, the primary mundane center of consciousness that you carry with you in everyday activities. The ego means I, by the way. So it's the I that goes to the store. It's the I that goes to work. It's, it's the everyday you in that sense, the way you think of yourself. And in the, the stage of the great work before adepthood, before knowledge and conversation, the characteristic state of consciousness is one of primarily identifying with the ego as the center of self. This gradually gets overturned throughout the first order grades, and we'll touch on that a little bit more uh, in terms of disidentifying with the ego as as the primary center. But um, for most people, most of the time, in most of life, you know, we think of ourselves as being that person who goes to the store, who goes to work, etc. Now, in contrast, we have what Jung called the self. Uh, with a capital S. This is the real center of our being. We're mostly unconscious of it as a default state, um, but through insight-oriented work in psychotherapy and certainly via the magical and mystical path when rightly pursued, um, we open up awareness of this truer self. The opening of this awareness in a more uh, secular mundane, you know, psychotherapeutic context might be working with uh, dream symbols, uh, development of intuition, um, tracing the symbolic narrative by watching um, the synchronicities that occur in our lives and, and that we can give meaning to. And within our uh, esoteric work, traditions such as the Kabbalah um, and all sorts of symbol sets that we use are really a framework for our interactions with our own unconscious and therefore the pathway to connection with the self. As, as I think I've mentioned before, um, the forging of this conscious connection between ego and self is really uh, the goal of depth work in, in a Jungian psychotherapeutic tradition, but also is one way of looking at the path of the great work that we are pursuing more likely in a deeper way than your average psychotherapy attendee is. In any case, it's the forging of the ego self axis which informs a lot of our understanding of what we're trying to do here. And I think you'll see the different ways we look at that. Now, in my discussion today, I'm not only going to be using the terminology from the Jungian model of the psyche, like ego and self and shadow and things like that, but also from Kabbalistic psychology here and there. And um, more or less, I'm using ego and ruach synonymously, and I'm using self and neshama uh, synonymously. They're not perfect analogies, but they're, they're close enough for, for the work we're trying to accomplish in this discussion today. So let's start by taking a look, now that we've defined things, at um, the everyday function of the ego. What does it do? What's it for? How does it help us? How does it hurt us? The most important fundamental here is to understand that the ego is the perceptual mechanism by which we interact constructively with the outer world. Uh, it's completely necessary to our interaction with the outer world. Therefore, you'll hear in my discussion today, there's, at no point are we um, doing that uh, fabled destruction of the ego in the sense that it's gone and just isn't there anymore. Um, what we are doing is um, understanding the right function of the ego, um, to put it in the proper relationship with the self, and ultimately 
to identify with that deeper center of self at our at our core as the the real center of who we are the star or cobs so um the ego is our lens through which we perceive the outer world it's necessarily individualized and therefore necessarily limited the information we gain by the useful illusion of viewing ourselves as a separate being um, the useful illusion of an inner and an outer world um, is one of the ways that we uh, we simply function in that outer world and we couldn't do it if we were immersed in um, undifferentiated consciousness while driving to the grocery store you know that uh, that would lead to all sorts of messes one of the uh, important mechanisms of the ego's functioning one of the ways in other words that it that it actually serves as a lens to look at the world is the psychological projections that we indulge in every day uh, in in one sense all our perception is a psychological projection in that we are um, imposing symbol sets and uh, categories and um, those sorts of, of labels onto this mass of perceptions that, that come to us. Um, so it's always going to be tailored by, um, by the ego. Um, but in a more specific sense, and in this case, I'm going to focus on the way we deal with other people, other Ruachs. Um, there's some there's some work we can do to um, to grow our understanding of our ego and its role in the great work for us by looking at these psychological projections onto people. Um, now, in a negative projection. And I am meaning that pejoratively. In a negative projection, the ego protects itself, for example, by judging the faults of others rather than undergoing the painful introspection necessary for its own real growth. In a positive projection, uh, such as idealizing a loved one, the ego yearns for union with something it perceives as external to itself. Uh, and thereby misses the opportunity to recognize the soul's inherent completeness. So in both cases, we're obsessed by this self and other dichotomy. In one case, it's a negative judging um, kind of energy. And in another case, it's uh, giving away a part of our own divinity, a part of our own uh, wholeness to the idea that we need to be completed by union with something else. Um, in either case, it's uh, a confrontation and acceptance of the shadow. Uh, the shadow, in Jungian terms, is uh, is very much like the shadow of ego. It's all those things we don't think of as ourselves, all those unacknowledged or even rejected aspects of self, positive and negative. Um, now, Crowley does some interesting commentary on this that I'm going to read to you in uh, a couple chapters from Lieber Aleph. The chapters, the, the comment bridges over these two chapters. The first one is um, um, on certain diseases of disciples, and the second is the following chapter on watching for faults in the house. Um, so I'm going to read them uh, as one uninterrupted passage here. Quoting now, We become that which obsesseth us, either through extreme hate or extreme love, Knowest thou not how the one is a symbol of the other? For this reason, since love is the formula of life, we are under bond to assimilate, in the end, that which we fear or hate. So then we shall be wise to mold all things within ourselves in quietness and modulation. But above all must we use all to our own end, adapting with adroitness even our weakness to the work. Therefore, watch heedfully the fault of another, that thou mayest correct it in thyself. For if it were not in thee, thou couldst not perceive it or understand it. So some wise words from, from Crowley on this concept. Now, at this point in our discussion, it should be fairly obvious, uh, and also from probably your, your understanding of the nature of Thelema and true will, 
itself, uh, it should be fairly obvious that the wants and the desires of the ego are, especially in the pre-adept stage, uh, often quite divorced from the true will of the real self. Uh, and once again, our work lies in forging that link between ego and self, consciously aligning our ego with the full power of the true trajectory of our soul, that is, the true will. Um, I thought of a technological metaphor for this, not something I use that often here, but uh, the state of the ego ruach is uh, reflective, essentially, of the bandwidth we have available for the influx of spiritual force. Um, if the bandwidth is narrowed um, because we have narrowed ourselves via uh, egoic obsessions, projections, imbalances, blockages, we've actually reduced our capacity to be a channel of this divine force. So you can see the importance, um, again, mostly we're talking here in the, in the first order of AA context, um, you can see the importance of the balancing self-analysis of the personality that should uh, be built in to, uh, to any magical path. Now, the ego is the part of you that feels pain, anger, joy, that has thoughts. You know, this is, these are Ruach functions. And uh, you are more than that. The real self is more than that, even though, as I've said, most of us, most of the time, operate day to day as if we're not more than that. That's our limitation. One of the greatest tools that we can all use in moving through life is to simply not buy what the ego is telling us as if it's the only truth. When we are in a depression, when we are overwhelmingly anxious about something, when we are, um, you know, distraught or hurt or angry, um, if we can simply take half a step back from that and remember that the part of us feeling that is not the whole of us, the, the star within is not worried about the bills. The star within is not worried about, uh, uh, you know, what so-and-so said that hurt our feelings. That's simply the ego. And if we can view the ego more like a pet and less like um, who we really are, we can get some degree of distance on on life's troubles, um, that doesn't mean we reject them. That doesn't mean we belittle them. That doesn't mean we uh, pretend that we don't have these feelings and responses. As I said before, that it's the ego that is our information gathering function in 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 the world, and so attending to these perceptions and experiences of ego is actually a, a doorway into to deeper work. So, you know, one way of looking at that is that if, um, if Nuit represents the complete infinite realm of all possibilities uh, of experience that presents itself to us, and we feel an emotion we don't like and uh, reject it and try to run away from it or suppress it or, um, you know, otherwise alienate ourselves from it. Essentially, we are saying this aspect of Nuit I reject. And we know that that's not going to be a productive uh, way of working in the long run. That, again, limits us to the conception of our, our own ego as being the, the center of who we are, as opposed to saying, okay, this part of me is feeling this, but I accept that what is before me is a perfect expression of the universe that I have to deal with and, and absorb and, and work with. So it's almost like if we reject these experiences of the ego, we, we have a roadmap, but we refuse to acknowledge where we are on it um, because we simply have distanced ourselves from our, our own placement on it by rejecting our experience. So accept where you are and then decide where you want to go. Now, the disidentification with the Ruach and ego and the identification with Neshama as the real center of who we are is, um, as I've said one or two times here, the, the overarching goal. 
Now, there are dangers of doing this prematurely. This falls under the broad category of uh, ego inflation, ways that the ego gets a little too full of itself, um, which is a you know pretty much the baseline functioning uh, of all humans from time to time. Um, but what I see in magical circles is um, this would be an example of this would be like a, a very young magician who has um, prematurely identified with this idealized adept self that they imagine they're they're wanting to to be um, and therefore they they kind of uh, do an end run around the ego development which is actually a prerequisite to developing into that adept uh, you can't short circuit that now some people are um, by karma by birth by genetics who knows whatever they some people are um, kind of precocious in in their um, in their ego development and, and I mean that in a good sense in the sense that they um, they seem to be on the fast track to spiritual development um, without some without falling into some of the pitfalls neuroses uh, that we associate with the ego but for the most part we all have kind of a long and windy road to follow in terms of ferreting out those shadow elements of self and developing our analysis and understanding of ourselves as a prerequisite to the, the deeper work. The proper way to pursue this, and by proper here I basically mean gradual and balanced, um, the proper method is built into the first orders of AA and basically can be described as beginning with finding Kether and Malkuth, the observing ego at Teferith sees the light of Kether in the natural world of Malkuth, in the manifest universe, since that is its role as a perceptual vessel of the universe, and uh, in the subconscious realm of Yesod, which we could think of as the Nefesh and the, the unconscious, the personal unconscious in Jung's model. Now, what is not happening in the pre-adept stage is direct conscious perception of Kether. The, the adept isn't staring right at the light of Kether. He is looking at the reflection of that divinity in the outer world and seeing that as a pathway inward. And that's pretty much what happens as the, the consciousness develops across the First Order in AA. Later, at... To Fareth, the opening of the path of Gimel, uh, impinging directly and consciously on our spiritual perception into Fareth. That's characteristic of the attainment of the knowledge and conversation. Now, only a balanced ego will be a proper vessel for this conscious communion. And uh, in, in my talk on a previous episode on the methods and tools of AA, I likened this to a properly formed and balanced cup to contain the light of the angel and um, the work I've been describing today of dealing with, with the matters of the ego and their proper context and the self-analysis that comes along with that should help with constructing this balanced vessel. Now, the greater the attainment, the greater the danger of ego inflation. It would be nice to think that attainment of knowledge and conversation uh, wipes out all these ego neuroses and makes us just such a nice person to be around all the time. But unfortunately, every attainment has its shadow side and every adept, every, every practitioner at every level must deal with the shadow side of wherever they are in the path. Now, the shadow side of Tefereth, um, which itself, of course, in its fullness represents spiritual enlightenment, um, the shadow side is spiritual vanity. Spiritual pride. Wow, I'm so cool that I arrived here. I've got an HGA, and now I'm even more powerful, and I can go out and uh, and be super cool in front of people. Well, you know, that's that's something everyone who gets to that stage is going to have to deal with at some level. Hopefully, that's spotted early on and approached mindfully and um, put in its place. Um, but this situation is only amplified in the passage between 5.6 and 7.4, between Tefereth through Gaborah to Chesed. Um, it's amplified unless 
the adept works hard to maintain the right relationship between ego and self even after this important attainment. Um, and here's where your lack of prior work can come up and bite you. If you haven't attained in a balanced way by conscientious working of the, the balancing tasks of the outer order grades, it's going to be that much harder to maintain a balance uh, in further attainments. Um, you might want to listen to my Living Philema episode on magical power if you haven't for more on this. Now, at this point, we've gotten our hypothetical um, aspirant through the elemental grades, through ego self-analysis, through analysis of projections, through um, the balancing tasks of the first order. The ego has found its right place in relationship to the angel and to the, you know, to the deeper self, the relationship between Ruach and Neshama. And here is where the ego comes up against its greatest challenge that it will ever encounter. And, and I've touched on this in the uh, formulas of Lux and Knox episode. Um, it has to come to terms with the futility of holding on to its sense of individual existence. This is the ultimate sense of ego death that confronts it. And um, so the, the, the situation is more of one of needing to be willing to destroy your ego rather than actually destroying your ego so that it's gone and non-functional, as I said at the beginning. Um, because only a fully developed ego, Ruach, that is also willing to abandon itself is a suitable sacrifice for the grail of Babylon and the transition of the abyss into mastery. Now, in all of this, you might want to refer to what was a pivotal book in my development and understanding. Um, it's not perfect, but um, if you haven't ever looked at Robert Moore's book called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, uh, I think the subtitle is The Archetypes of the Masculine, um, that's a great place to start. Um, he looks at the uh, four archetypes listed there, um, both in their fullness and in their shadow sides. And so for the magician, he's talking about the, the magician archetype as, uh, as one of uh, power, secret power, um, subtle power, uh, non-physical you know, physical power, but, uh, but an inner power. And so all of those things are obviously you know, useful tools to access. But on the shadow side, um, it's control, it's manipulativeness, it's... Um, it's my secret power gives me the right to lord myself over you. You know, it's it's that kind of uh, debased power drive in a sense. Now, um, this is an awful lot like the polarity of the um, Adeptus Exemptus in his fullness, willing to move on and abandon the ego conceptions versus the Black Brother. Um, in his towers of ego that he won't abandon or tear down. Um, in Parsifal, this is the dichotomy between Parsifal in his final attainment as the Grail King versus Klingzor, who's simply stolen the spear and won't let go of it and, and is there in his tower clinging to what he sees as power. So I hope today's discussion has been helpful to you, not just in a conceptual sense, but hopefully you'll be able to uh, take what we've discussed today and apply that to your everyday experience of your ego and what that means to you and your understanding of it. Um, I also want to leave you with another book recommendation. I've focused a lot on um, Jungian concepts here today, and He's hard to, to get into sometimes if you don't know where to start. One of the best books on this is by June Singer called Boundaries of the Soul. There's going to be a link on the blog, but uh, I highly recommend that book as an entry point um, for uh, understanding his overall system. So, as always, I welcome uh, 
your comments and suggestions. I should thank uh, Johannes, who contacted me through livingthelima.com with some questions about ego inflation and the like that got me thinking about today's um, episode. Um, please visit livingthelima.com for more uh, information about my work and to contact me. Also, Living Thelema on Facebook is there. Now, um, as usual, I'm taking a bit of a winter retirement. I'm going to uh, put Living Thelema on hiatus for uh, December and January, and we'll be back in February 2012 for another episode. And uh, thank you very much for listening.